It was late in the spring of 1933 when a gang of masked men burst into a wealthy judge's Kansas City house, brandishing a sawed-off shotgun. The judge wasn't home, but it wasn't him the men were after, it was his daughter. At the time, she was upstairs in the bathtub, lathered in bubbles. Get out of the bath and get dressed, you're coming with us, said the men. They explained to her that she was going to be held ransom. She asked for how much, and one of the men replied $60,000. Her actual response to that was, I'm worth more than that. Subsequently, she was taken to a house and chained up in the basement. The gang would eventually get $30,000. Hey, it was better than nothing. The woman was released, but get this, she later let it be known that she supported the men that had imprisoned her. So what's going on? How can someone be pushed around, chained up, held for days like that, then admit that she was fond of those guys? They got caught in the end, of course, but even during the trial, the woman stuck up for them. Her name was Mary McElroy, and she was 25 when she was put through this ordeal. The kidnappers all received harsh sentences, and the gang leader was sentenced to be hanged but that eventually was commuted to a life sentence. When young Mary heard about the hanging sentence, she wrote to the governor saying, his sentence has hung as heavily over me as over him. Through punishing a guilty man, his victim will be made to suffer equally. It seemed she really took pity on this guy. In fact, throughout the gang's imprisonment, she would visit them and take them flowers as well as other gifts. If it sounds to you like something was not quite right with Mary, then you are on the right path. Something was very wrong with her. She was mentally unsound. For several Several years after her kidnapping, she displayed strange behavior and had multiple nervous breakdowns. She got addicted to opiates and lived with her father, seldom communicating with the outside world. When he bit the dust, she became a recluse, but she would never relinquish her fondness for her captors. Mary was experiencing something that had been called Stockholm Syndrome, although at the time there really wasn't a word for it. This is what we mean when we say doctors were perplexed at her behavior. Such a condition wasn't common at all. The term actually came about after something that happened in, you guessed it, Stockholm in Sweden. This is an absolutely crazy story in itself, so we think you deserve to hear the details. The opening scene goes something like this. A Swedish man with a very colorful rap sheet named Jan Erik struts into a bank in the capital city. He isn't there to talk about a loan for a new meatball business, though. He's going to rob the place. He pulls out a gun and demands the tellers open the drawers and hand him the cash. He isn't particularly a bright guy and hasn't planned this robbery very well, but in his defense, he at least had painted his face black and donned a wig and sunglasses. You can only imagine how that looked to the folks in the bank. To make matters even more weird, he then pulled something else out, and it wasn't another weapon, it was a transistor radio. He placed that carefully on the counter, and then he turned it on to Swedish Radio P3. Okay, now he had music. What next? Well, unlucky for him, within no time at all, the cops were on the scene. While he was fiddling about with his radio and trying to find the right channel, someone had hit the alarm button. The cop entered the bank, which today might seem kind of brave. Drop your weapon, shouted the policeman, and naturally the robber's response was to shoot him. Another cop had entered the bank by this time, and then Jan Eric did something else not written in the manual, Life of Crime Part 1, Bank Robbing for Beginners. He told the cop to sit on a chair and ordered him to sing a song, any song. The cop thought for a while and then started doing a rendition of Elvis Presley's Lonesome Cowboy. After this, he let the cops outside know what he wanted, and if his demands weren't met, his hostages in the bank would get it. No doubt he was taken seriously, he was, after all, a loon. He asked for 3 million kroner in cash, and half of it in Swedish money and the rest in foreign currency. He also wanted a fast car with a full tank of gas, two pistols, and a free road for himself. He then demanded his friend be let out of prison to join him, and he also said he would like two hostages on the road with him. This friend by by the way was a safe cracker, so perhaps we were a little harsh saying Jan Eric was a few fries short of a happy meal. His friend did end up in the bank with him, but he had promised the Swedish government to act as a negotiator. We won't go into every detail, but the negotiations went on as the world watched on their TV screens. The hostages would later say Jan Eric walked around at times singing Roberta Flack's Killing Me Softly. That was perhaps not the best song to hear while you're being held captive by a man holding a gun. While this story sounds amusing, violence was used at times, but on other other occasions, the hostage takers were apparently pretty friendly. The ordeal went on for six days, so the hostages and their captors got to know each other fairly well. They barricaded the hostages in a vault, so we might say it was cozy. Nonetheless, we've seen a photo of the hostages in the bank vault, and it doesn't exactly look like they're having a fabulous time. Later, it was discovered that the men had told the hostages they were going to get shot, but strangely they didn't seem to mind. To understand Stockholm Syndrome, you need to know what one of the hostages later said to the New Yorker in an interview. He said this of his abductor, When he treated us well, we could think of him as an emergency god. 
Another hostage later explained how she thanked her abductor when he told her he wouldn't kill her, but uh, just shoot her in the leg. He was a compassionate god, you see. The police finally got on top of the situation and the men said they would give up their hostages, but when it was time to go, the two abductors and those hostages embraced and kissed and shook hands. One of the female hostages told the cops, don't hurt them. This sounds like a jolly old time for the hostages the way we've told it, but at the time their lives were certainly in danger. They had guns to their head, some of them had been pushed around, one woman had a rope tied around her neck. Was this just another one of those days when a bank happens to be full of masochists? No is the answer to that if you need telling. It wasn't only the cops and the public that thought the captives adoring their captors was perhaps a little strange. Some of the captives knew themselves that they were acting weird. One of them, after her ordeal, even went to see a psychiatrist and she reportedly said to him, is there something wrong with me? Why don't I hate them? They didn't feel indebted to the cops for saving them. They felt indebted to the good guys that hadn't blown off their heads. They wouldn't let anyone say a bad word that might taint their captor's sparkling image and diminish their outstanding generosity. Some of the hostages even went to visit the guys in prison. The world of psychiatry heard about this strange phenomenon and wanted to understand it. They decided to call it Stockholm Syndrome. By the way, Jan Erik moved to Thailand after his release and wrote a book by the same name. So, Stockholm Syndrome, in short, means sympathizing with a captor or in some cases, being close to your captor. Before we go into detail about why it might happen, we'll present to you another case. This one is more controversial for reasons you'll see. In Austria in 1988, a 10-year-old girl was kidnapped and thrown into a van. She was then held captive in a dark room under a garage for eight years. Her captor might at times be nice, but then he would just change and become abusive. The girl at the start of her ordeal was never allowed to leave the room, a room that had no windows and was soundproof. It was like a living hell. She was a tortured bird in a concrete cage. While she later said she despaired at times, she also said being held like a prisoner had its benefits. She said of her experience, I spared myself many things. I did not start smoking or drinking, and I did not hang out in bad company. She got a TV and books, but she wasn't exactly spoiled for food. The girl later said that she was so thin and weak she could hardly move, and then at times the guy would beat her up so badly she sustained injuries that made it hard to stand up. Later on, her captor would let her out and take the girl, now a teenager, on trips. She never tried to escape, although she said sometimes she thought about it. When she was 18, she finally escaped. She told the authorities who she was, and she Shocked, looking at this girl who had hardly grown in height while in captivity and was emaciated, they took her in. The hunt was on for the captor, but he decided that life was short and jumped in front of a speeding train. What did that girl say about her ordeal? The beatings, the starvation, the confinement, the mental torture. She said, I feel more and more sorry for him, he's a poor soul. That was before she knew he killed himself. I mourn for him, she said in another interview after she found out. She got a lot of hate mail from the public for saying stuff like that. She said while she was imprisoned, she had to delude herself as a way to cope. She had to somehow create a world which was not a constant horror. She told The Guardian in 2010, in situations when I was being bathed, I picture myself being at a spa. When he gave me something to eat, I imagined him as a gentleman, that he was doing all this for me to be gentlemanly, serving me. She was well aware when she became a teenager that he was crazy and her situation was terrible, and she did try to take her life at least one time. But she also kind of understood her captor. Just before her escape, she told him, I really am grateful to you for not killing me. And and for taking such good care of me. That is very nice of you, but you can't force me to stay with you. I'm my own person with my own needs. This situation must come to an end, and end it did. So one part of Stockholm Syndrome might be adapting to your situation, and in fact, the girl we just talked about has denied being mentally ill and said in a way she just made the best out of a bad situation. She said this to the BBC, if you spend a great deal of time with a person, it's about empathy, communication. Looking for a normality within the framework of a crime is not a syndrome, it's a survival strategy. In the case of the hostages at the bank, their lives were in the hands of their captors, so psychologists say they developed powerful feelings for these guys. Those men were the ones who were going to let them live, and so they were kind of gods to them. And they did let them live, so hey, they were benevolent gods in the end. Anyone in captivity for a while might at some point show gratitude toward their captors for even the smallest acts of kindness. After a longer period of time, the captive person becomes reliant on the captor for everything, and so they might become like a child to that person. One psychologist wrote, they 
experience a type of infantilization, where like a child they are unable to eat, speak, or go to the toilet without permission. There have been studies when the captive person was told that life without their captor is dangerous and they believed it, to the extent of not trying to even run away when they had the chance. So first a person might feel utter terror, but as a survival mechanism they might even begin to empathize with the person who has them locked up. It's a coping mechanism and somewhere in the mind a switch might get flicked and the person might start liking their captor. It's the only way to get through it. They submit to their god, and when that god doesn't exhibit its wrath, this becomes an act of kindness. This submission, importantly, isn't a conscious choice in that the victim doesn't think, hmm, I better be nice to this dude. They actually just become nice to him. In some cases, they might even help their captor evade the authorities. The FBI once said that 8% of kidnapping victims had shown signs of Stockholm Syndrome. There is so much gray area though because every situation is unique. Like the girl we talked about, some victims will tell you that they are not suffering from anything. Stockholm Syndrome is not actually recognized as a mental illness or as an official psychiatric diagnosis, but it's a term used to describe what victims might be experiencing. You wouldn't say, he's got Stockholm Syndrome, but you might know he's experiencing something like Stockholm Syndrome. At least now you all know something else that came from Sweden besides IKEA and meatballs. Can you imagine being kidnapped and this happening to you? We'd love to hear your thoughts, so let us know what you think in the comments. Now go watch These Missing People Were Mysteriously Found Alive. Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.